The title of my talk is The Shadow Play as Medium of Memory in Global Art. Recent decades have seen the emergence of an art of memory different from that elaborated in Francis Yates's canonical book of that same title. Issues of political, especially traumatic memory, have been taken up by visual and literary artists across the world and in very different contexts. Not surprisingly, the debates about the Shoah and artistic representation have played a key role in the way artists, not just in the northern trans transatlantic, but in Africa, Asia, Australia, and Latin America, have taken up memory and forgetting in their respective cultures. <clears throat> uh, in earlier work, I have discussed how the Shoah migrated into other geographic and historical contexts, both closing down some and opening up other dimensions of understanding. Today, I want to speak about two artists from the post-colonial periphery whose work articulates memory issues in aesthetically ambitious and conceptually robust ways in their respective shadow plays. The theatrical shadow play can look back on a geographically broad and historically deep tradition. Independently from each other, my two contemporary artists have deployed the shadow play as part of that ancient art of global performance. They each have invented a discrete medium which deliberately sidesteps or even opposes a technologically advanced video and digital art practice. In Alini Milani's and William Kentridge's works, the shadow play has morphed into a medium of political memory and intervention. They have invented unique forms of the shadow play, not in order to represent traumatic pasts, but to create a flash of recognition of the past in the now, as Walter Benjamin might phrase it. Memory of the partition of 1947 and of the decades of apartheid and their respective after effects determine these works in such a way that the very form of the shadow play stages not just the content, but the very structure of memory, forgetting, and evasion. Spectacular theatricality is playfully and sensually bound to a rigorous formal exploration of what effective seeing might mean in contemporary artistic practice. New works by both artists marked high points of this year's Documenta 13 in Kassel. Kentridge, with the first version of his installation, The Refusal of Time, Malani with her video, Shadow Play, entitled In Search of Vanished Blood. The technical treatment of the Shadow Play, their relationship to European modernism, combined with the simultaneous use of local Indian or African traditions, makes these two artists into paradigmatic figures for any discussion of global art, of transnational, even transcontinental appropriation and of the role of the medium and the media in contemporary art. In this lecture, I want to focus on the respective specificity of these shadow plays, which nevertheless share certain dimensions that facilitate a comparison. Both Malani and Kentridge belong to a generation whose experience is shaped by colonialism and decolonization. Their works circle around the long-term after-effects of historical trauma, partition, and apartheid, always in aesthetically complex forms rather than in documentary or agitpop style. Both artists studied in Paris, but neither was taken with the then-dominant artistic trends of the 1960s and 1970s, such as pop minimal concept art. As opposed to many other global artists, they are not permanently displaced to a Western metropolis. Malani comes from a secular Sikh family from Karachi, forced to flee to India in the chaos of partition. Kentridge comes from a family of Jewish refugees from Lithuania, which settled in South Africa several generations ago. Migration and exile is in both their backgrounds. Both came to be known in biennials and international exhibitions during the 1990s, 
Kassel, Johannesburg, Istanbul. Both have worked in the theater, mobilizing theatrical spectacularity, narration, and figuration to, captive their, to captivate their viewers. Both use literary models of modernism. Alfred Jarry is for Kentridge, what Heiner Müller is for Malani, models to be transformed in South African or Indian contexts. European avant-gardist art and literature is present in their work as montage, bricolage, free appropriation, but never as canonical ideal or as nostalgic set piece. In their privileging of a leftist avant-gardism, neither Kentridge nor Milani suffer from Harold Bloom's famous anxiety of influence. The avant-gardist moment of their work, however, is neither captured with the category of shock, nor does it aim at some utopia of a sublation of art into life. The claim to aesthetic autonomy is not abandoned, but the traditional static and unitary notion of autonomy is medially fractured and fraying. Central to both artists is the issue of medially transmitted perception of a hidden afterlife, of past violence that keeps erupting time and again in India as in South Africa. It is important to note that both artists utilize the shadow play to stage the unreliability of memory without, however, lapsing into political relativism. They interweave avant-gardist montage with their respective local traditions of popular culture. Reverse painting and 19th century Kaligat figuration in Malani, charcoal drawing, etching, and expressive renderings <coughs> of everyday scenes in Kentridge. And both artists combine these very different traditional modes of representation with obsolete uh, support technologies. Stop animation film in Kentridge, and he himself speaks ironically of Stone Age animation. Slide projection and simple motor functions that rotate Malani's Milar cylinders. All their projects are unabashedly figurative and narrative, postmodern on one hand, but always with an umbilical cord to classic modernist experiments with mediality. The list of affinities could be continued. In what follows, I will focus on two shadow plays, Kentridge's Shadow Procession of 1999 and Milani's In Search of Vanished Blood of 2012. And let me begin now by showing Kentridge's short seven minute long film. He himself called Shadow Procession a kind of residue of his theater work on Ubu and the Truth Commission from the mid-90s. In the play, the film's three parts functioned as supplement to the stage action, and yet the seven-minute-long tripartite film can be read as a work in its own right, and as such it has become known in art galleries and museums. Yeah. 
in a lecture of 2001 entitled In Praise of Shadows, Kentridge argued against Plato's cave parable, insisting that shadows do have a pedagogic epistemological value. Rather than confronting us with naked and transparent truth, they stimulate the visual imagination to fill in the gaps of that which is not or only barely visible, a process that can, of course, lead to insecurity and productive ambiguity. In that way, they teach us to negotiate the blind spots of vision and knowledge. Shadows promote sensuous, that is, aesthetic, reflection on the practices of seeing and the inescapable dialectic of light and shadow. I quote from Kentridge's recent Harvard Norton lectures, quote, it's in the very limitation and leanness of shadows that we learn, in the gaps, in the leaps we have to make to complete an image, and in this we perform the generative act of constructing an image. Recognizing in this activity our agency in seeing, our agency in apprehending the world." End quote. The production of images through shadow art is described here as a dialogic process that activates the spectator toward an always worldly understanding. Now the figures of the shadow procession hover in a realm of undecidability. We know neither where they come from nor where they are going. Processions and marches always have a goal, the realm of the sacred or its secular equivalent, such as the progress of society, the protest against injustice, or the migrants' search for a new home. After a century of murderous utopias and colonialisms, thus Kentridge, it is just not possible to name a goal or a telos of this procession, and thus the procession simply peters out and breaks off at the end. It is never made entirely clear whether its purpose is mourning, supplication, flight, or protest. The parts of the film simply differ too much from one another. The music underlying the first part is elegiac, hymnical, and repetitive. The falsetto voice and melancholy refrain played on the accordion by Alfred Macalamela, a Johannesburg street musician, are mournful and plaintive. But being based on the melody of a religious hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, they also contain a moment of hope. Both the music and the images point toward apartheid, whose collapse has set in motion a migration, a march into an unknown and insecure future. Or could these be the shadows of those who did not survive apartheid, a kind of ghostly death march toward the beyond? a miner hanging from a gallows, and I'm still talking about the first part of the film, a miner hanging from a gallows suggests something like that. Two other figures carry a corpse, yet others move on prostheses, perhaps resulting from injuries suffered in the war with Angola. The ending of the first segment then shows a group of bent over figures who carry a whole city on their backs. No doubt the black workers who, will, who built Johannesburg for their colonial masters. And then there are the miners who mined the gold around Johannesburg that provided the basis for the wealth and the rule of the white colonizer. The second part of shadow procession is a kind of intermezzo that provides a transition to a very differently structured procession in the third part. In this intermezzo, we see Alfred Jarry's grotesque Ubu figure with his typical pointed headgear, dressed in a loose black cape, huge tummy, and with gigantic shovel-like hands. In front of a lit screen, reminiscent of early cinema, Ubu climbs up to the stage from below. Moving in a lumbering way to the rhythm of drums, Jarry's grotesque scatological dictator cracks a whip as a non-audible laughter rocks his heavy body. Ubu, a slaveholder and colonizer. Explosions and screams fill the soundtrack at the beginning of the sequence, but seeing and hearing are not in sync. We hear the cracking of the whip, but we do not see it. <laughs> 
We see the laughter, but we do not hear it. The elegiac melancholy effect of the slowly moving burdened figures of part one is turned here into political satire and burlesque. No question here who is the target of the whip's lashes. The third part then returns to the procession, but now it is very different figures who cross the space before the screen that formed the backdrop for Ubu's pantomime. This procession moves rather chaotically and faster, and it is accompanied by inflaming toyi toyi songs and slogans known from the rallies of the anti-apartheid movement of the early 1990s. Objects such as scissors, a compass, a stamp, a megaphone are anthropomorphized, taking their place in the procession, which comes across rather as a revolt of the objects. Yet another homage, perhaps, to the early cinema of attractions. A woman in a headscarf and with a wandering staff suddenly turns around and attacks a lady of the upper classes who appears as an Italian espresso pot with a tiltable lid. A live cat stretching itself as if awakening from sleep suddenly covers the whole screen and a gigantic eye gazing in horror is suddenly interspersed in the procession, reminding us, of course, of Buñuel's Chien Andalou. Surreal, anarchic violence threatens the orderly progress of the procession. The earlier melancholy shadow procession has become a surreal and chaotic danse macabre. It shows us other actors, white actors, I would submit, and their objects, which of course also appear as black shadows. But then it suddenly breaks off. And perhaps this third part, with its spasmodically twitching cat performing an aggressive dance on its hind legs, points already toward the social chaos of the conflicts of the post-apartheid period. Nothing here suggests transition to democracy or equality of white and black. Now the silhouetted figures of the filmic animation are of course inspired by the puppet theater. In Kentridge, of course, we do not have puppets, but two-dimensional flat figures, coarsely and schematically collaged out of scraps of black paper. Rivets and wires join their limbs and make them movable shot by shot. Once projected as film, they feature those abrupt choppy movements we know from early cinema. These flat monochrome black figures first appear before a gray blurry background, but then in the third part in front of that brightly lit screen from the intermezzo, both times accompanied by emotionally loaded music. The materiality of bodies and things as well as their texture is eliminated in the shadows. We don't always know exactly what we see, but that is precisely what fascinates the spectator who tries to understand this being on the road of people and things. It is this process of seeing and understanding in which Kentridge wants to engage the spectator. It is a training, I would submit, in insecurity and ambiguity, leading to doubt in the transparency of seeing and of the seen. This process is aesthetically staged in the three parts of shadow procession, as well as in the way in which memory is materialized in the by now well-known series of filmic animations entitled Nine Drawings for Projection, about which I now want to speak briefly before turning to Malani. Uh, but first, a comment on the politics of visual ambiguity. <clears throat> the instability of vision and the play with shadows does not mean that Kentridge would have espoused an ambiguous position vis-a-vis -vis apartheid or its afterlife. In his early years, he participated in anti-apartheid protests and designed posters for a political theater in Johannesburg. His theater work culminated in the 1990s with a sharp critique of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the production of this play, Ubu and the Truth Commission. The drawings for projection with their key narrative figures of the entrepreneur Soho Eckstein and the intellectual dreamer Felix Teitelbaum, and many of you may have seen some of these works, 
demonstrate clearly enough that he tried to sidestep the binary opposition of perpetrators and victims that dominated the hearings of the TRC. Instead, Kentridge focused on fellow traveling, beneficiaries, and personal responsibility for colonialism and apartheid. A process of memory as recognition is set in motion which resists the all too common evasions and forgetfulness. Now in a 99 interview, curator Carolyn Christoph Bakargev asked Kentridge, rather naively I think, about the implications of his moral relativism, what she called moral relativism. Kentridge's answer couldn't, couldn't have been any clearer. I don't think it's relativism, he said. To say that one needs art or politics that incorporate ambiguity and contradiction is not to say that one then stops recognizing and condemning things as evil. However, it might stop one being so utterly convinced of the certainty of one's own solutions." End quote. Now in the drawings of projection, uh, a charcoal drawing, and I'll show a little clip in a minute, a charcoal drawing is photographed, then minimally changed, then photographed again and on and on. Drawing by drawing, scene by scene, a film of moving images emerges from this stop animation technique. Remembering and forgetting are constitutive for Kentridge's practice of charcoal drawing which anchor these animations. While the shadows we see in shadow procession are based on paper cutouts mounted one behind the other and manipulated between shots, the shadow structure of drawings for projection is of a different nature. Here the shadow is the preserved trace of the erasure, a stain or barely visible outline of bodies, buildings, objects, which points to the respectively preceding version of the drawing. The medium of drawing becomes palimpsest in the drawings themselves and then again in their cinematic animation. Continuous metamorphosis of things, faces, landscapes is the guiding principle in the progression of drawing. Erasure, effacement, wiping out, turn into the material manifestations of the very structure of memory. What remains in the movement of time is the trace. Erasure and effacement become a metaphor for the instability of historical memory. The drawings thus offer not only self-reflection of the fascinating bricolage of charcoal drawing and filmic animation, in their specific form, they reflect the structure of political memory itself, which is always subject to erasure, to effacement, evasion, and forgetting. The metamorphosis of that which is remembered corresponds to the metamorphoses in the creation of the charcoal drawings. Synchronic images emerge, which as palimpsests in motion, carry their own diachronic negation along with them. The commonplace binary of memory versus forgetting as an either or is belied by the preservation of traces of the past as shadows, as stains, as mnemonic outline in the present all the way to the traces of charcoal dust visible on paper and in the film. The past remains materially present even if only hinted at in trace elements, in shadow-like residues. Different shapes of forgetting are, of course, as we know, inescapably part of memory. To remember means to read traces. It demands imagination, attentiveness of the gaze, construction. This becomes especially palpable in the ways in which Kentridge treats the Johannesburg landscape, a landscape that in its industrial deprivation and stony fellow flatness seems rather a negation of landscape in an emphatic sense most certainly negation of traditional landscape painting, which in the South African context always invested in lush fantasies about Africa. And I now want to show the uh, two-minute clip of another animation called Felix in Exile, which gives you a little bit of a sense of what happens between landscape and human bodies, and I will talk about that after the clip. Je me dis que c'est le, 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 le.
Felix in exile, landscape as represented in the drawings that Felix looks at uh, in his exile room becomes a space of visible and invisible social conflicts, place of exploitation, manslaughter and murder. Kentridge draws an industrial landscape with telegraph poles, electric pylons, sinkholes and gigantic mine heaps in this work as in others. The surface of this landscape is molded by the work in the veins of gold underneath, the exploitation and oppression of the black miners. In another film entitled Mine, uh, he shows the depth dimension and exploitative structure of this landscape. Felix in Exile, however, deals with manifestations on the surface. A landscape as history, I would argue, is here the main theme. A female black land surveyor with her theodolite, her instrument, points to the time after apartheid when the land is surveyed anew by its original inhabitants. At the same time, the past intrudes as she sees the land littered with slain bodies, which then are metaphorically and literally covered by newspapers, melting eventually into the landscape and becoming invisible. Here Kentridge used documentary press photos of the Sharpeville massacre from 1960 as the basis for his drawings. In a surreal mimetic mirror scene beyond the passage you have seen, Felix, the artist intellectual, stands eye to eye with this black land surveyor who is shot in the end with her body metamorphizing into a sinkhole in the landscape. It's the same sinkhole with which the sequence began. The film then ends with a naked Felix standing in that sinkhole, helpless and at a loss before this film, too, just breaks off. Kentridge's words remind me of one of the first scenes in Landsmann's Shoah, where Simon Srebnik, survivor of the mass killings and killings in Kelmno, returns to the killing fields. Kentridge says, quote, I'm really interested in the terrain's hiding of its own history and the correspondence this has with the way memory works. The difficulty we have in holding on to passions, impressions, ways of seeing things, the way that things that seem so indelibly imprinted on our memories still fade and become elusive is mirrored in the way in which the terrain itself cannot hold on to the events played out on it." End quote. So even landscape, a cipher of invariability and consistency, cannot hold on to the past and provide witness. Felix remembers the violence done, but he is the intellectual outsider who does not convert his memory into political agency. And one may well read this as a comment on the problem facing the artist William Kentridge himself. <laughs> 
Now, Nalini Milani's video shadow plays, as she calls them, are radically different from those of Kentridge, despite all the similarities that I've pointed to earlier, or not similarities, but affinities. The movement of image is created with very different and mainly non-cinematic technical means. Luxurious coloring clashes with the black and white of the projected shadows, while in Kentridge animations there is at best the blue of water, a minimal utopian moment in the stony Johannesburg landscape. Regional and popular traditions of the great Indian epics, like the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, are foregrounded in Milani much more than appropriations of indigenous black African art in Kentridge. Nalani deploys the narrative potential of Greek and Indian mythology, while Kentridge invents prototypical contemporary figures, the entrepreneurial South African mogul Soho Eckstein and the artist intellectual Felix Teitelbaum. The gender difference of these invoked figures is immediately visible. Men in Kentridge, women in Medea. Women, excuse me, women like Medea, Sita, Cassandra in Malani. Malani's image narrations proceed in repetitive loops, while Kentridge's shadow procession breaks off inconclusively and Felix in exile, as I suggested, gets stuck in no man's land. Malani herself speaks or sings, often digitally distorted, on the soundtrack of her works. Kentridge's films use music composed by his close cooperator, Philip Miller, as in this film, Felix in Exile, or he uses standard tunes from classical or popular archives, as in Shadow Procession. Kentridge's animations work with a black box, which creates a fixed observer position. Malani's Millar cylinders, which I'll show in a second, permit the observer to move freely in a space of multiple projections and objects, and to try out different perspectives, even to become part of the shadow play itself. Despite, despite all these differences, their projects can be compared since both stage the problematic of memory and forgetting of political trauma with subtle aesthetic means that aim at a deeply textured understanding of the present in the past and the past in the present. Ever since 1991, Milani's work in a variety of media has focused on issues of political religious violence in India. Key here has been the violence toward women during the partition of 1947, a violence repeated in the murderous pogroms of Hindus on Muslims in 1992 and 2002 in Gujarat. Unreflected and mostly repressed political memory of the events of 1947 is mobilized by Malani in order to shed light on the nationalist ideology and religious fanaticism of the BJP party, an ideology that articulates itself as it were over her dead body, the body of women. Malani's goal is not to generate melancholy memory about past injustice. She is rather concerned with repetitive cycles of violence in the present. Her central question, one could say, is this. How can human pain and social suffering, past and present, be rendered visually in such a way that its representation nurtures and illuminates life, rather than indulging in aesthetic stylization, voyeuristic titillation, or even worse, succumbing to fatalism in the face of mythic cycles of violence? How can art contribute to blocking the repetition compulsions of gendered violence. Her video shadow plays draw on an expensive lexicon of Asian and European figures and images developed in her earlier oil and watercolor painting, her drawings, her video installations, and her theater projects. Mythic figures from the great Indian epics appear in the style of popular Kaligat painting of the 19th century. Greek mythology is represented by figures like Medea and Cassandra, whose fate is set in relation to women figures in Indian myth, like Draupadi from the Mahabharata or Sita from the Ramayana. Recent literary texts, such as Christa Wolf's Cassandra, Heiner Müller's Medea Material, 
or Mahasveta Devi's breast stories mediate this mythic material for and in the political present. Now Milani's political commitment is more upfront and on the surface than that of Kentridge. And yet Malani's works are not to be read simply in terms of their message. And I'm not even sure whether her work is politically more effective than Kentridge's, especially since at a time of an anti-feminist backlash, Malani's coolly understated feminist anger may seem obsolete to many. But even skeptics can hardly avoid the lure and fascination these shadow plays provoke. Anyway, an attempt to read her anti-phallic engagement only in the context of local Indian conditions, I think, would founder on Malani's transnational claims. The question is, how is this engagement rendered aesthetically? How is it translated into form? And to answer that question, let me now focus on the video shadow play Malani created for this year's documenta. It is entitled, In Search of Vanished Blood, after a poem by the Pakistani poet Fez Ahmad Fez, a poem that conjures up the excess of violence that accompanied the partition of Bangladesh from Pakistan in 1971. So let's have the uh, clip of that one now. Cassandra speaking. In the heart of darkness, under the sun of torture, to the capitals of the world, in the name of the victims, I eject all the sperm I have received. I turn the milk of my breasts into poison. I take back the world I gave birth to. I bury it in my womb. Submission. Long live hate, rebellion, and death. 
So, installed in the lowest room in the deep reaches of the Documenta Halle uh, this past summer, this all-around image Malani calls a video freeze consists of five Millar cylinders hanging from the ceiling and turning slowly in the manner of prayer wheels. In the technique of reverse painting, the cylinders are covered with colorful mythic figures, animals, and objects floating disconnectedly in space. Shadow effects on the walls of this high ceiling gallery hall result from the light projection of other painted, drawn, or simply reproduced images, which six projectors cast through the Mila cylinders onto the respective opposing wall. These projected images, some of them themselves in motion, are superimposed, palimpsest-like, by the shadows cast from the figures painted onto the turning cylinders. The projections consist of drawings, some of them set in motion, as in Kentridge, by a stop animation technique. Or they consist of filmed faces, photos of office towers, comic-like drawn figures and scenes, reproductions of Mybridge's famous running dogs, and so forth. The superimposition of cyclical shadow effects and the moving projections make it difficult to read and establish meaning of images and scenes. Mythic material casts shadows on image montages that concern problems in the present. Mutilations by landmines, executions, oppression of women, etc. In an interview this past spring, Malani commented on her new project. She said something that's quite similar, actually, to what, Kent, what I quoted from Kentridge earlier. She said, darkness is more potent than light. It just needs a shadow, and you can obliterate light. How quickly something that has to do with enlightenment or revelation can be completely destroyed. Because a shadow is very strong. It has no materiality, and yet it is so strong." End quote. So even if shadow threatens and dissolves the light of enlightenment, there also is that other enabling aspect. It is only shadow that makes us aware of what stands in the way of enlightenment. As in Kentridge, light can only be understood by detour through the shadows. In a key projection, we see the head of a young woman wrapped completely by a white bandage onto which the beginning lines of the title poem, In Search of Vanished Blood, are projected. In repetitive loops, the shadow of a vile mythical creature passes over this bandaged head. The creature, an invention of Malani's, holds two captured human bodies in its cancer-like fangs and gulps down a naked child into its beak-like maw. The motif of the destructive monster must be linked to other images of the shadow play. A Cassandra figure foretelling doom, the mat matriarchal goddess Kali painted on the cylinder in Kaligat style, which you did not see in this clip, etc. As always, the unifying theme is violence. I mean, that much can be intuited as one sees this for the first time. But only as one considers the soundtrack with its literary citations does it become evident that Malani's cyclical narrative at, aims at resistance and revolt. So just as other shadow plays by this artist, In Search of Vanished Blood superimposes different times and multiple spaces. The space of Indian and Greek mythology, the time of partition and its repetitive violent after effects, the time of global capital and its destructive effects in the agrarian hinterland of India. The multiplicity of this montage is not formally united by some defined spatial perspective. It is obvious that the monstrous creature represents an ultimate threat as drops of blood drip onto the face of a young woman, again, not in the clip, unfortunately, or when that tightly bandaged head appears, as it were, a perversion of the veil. The poem by Fez Ahmad Fez projected onto the bandaged head as if onto an empty page reads, and I quote a few lines, there is no sign of blood, not anywhere. I have searched everywhere. The executioner's hands are clean. 
his nails transparent. The sleeves of each assassin are spotless. No sign of blood, no trace of red. Not on the edge of the knife, none on the point of the sword. The ground is without stains, the ceiling white." End quote. Now literary historians will tell us that the poem was written as a reflection on disappearances in Kashmir and the violent excesses of the secession of East Pakistan, which led to the foundation of Bangladesh in 1971. The monster, however, painted on one of the Mila cylinders, says Malani, must be read as an allegory of the land-grabbing multinational corporations which are in cahoots with the Indian elite who drive the indigenous rural poor in West Bengal and other areas from their land in order to mine bauxite and other valuable minerals. Resistance against these expropriations from above is organized and led by the Naxals, the so-called tribals, who have resorted to arms. And here again now Malani draws on a mythical literary figure from the Mahabharata, rewritten and modernized in Mahasveta Devi's breast stories to represent this resistance. The figure is named Draupadi, Dopti in Naxal dialect, the story of a woman who refuses to abandon her land and is then gang raped by the police. In a stop animation drawing projected through one of the cylinders in this work with the corporate monster, we see the metamorphosis of a young woman in a sari holding a baby being changed into a uniformed resistance fighter holding a rifle. Now both drawings actually reproduce newspaper photographs from the Naxal milieu. I mean, just as Kentridge reproduced photographs from the Sharpeville massacre. The soundtrack then transforms the Draupadi figure into a Cassandra in revolt. And since you probably didn't hear the words very clearly, I'll read them briefly. The quote on the tape that you heard is, this is Cassandra speaking, in the heart of darkness, under the sun of torture, to the capitals of the world, in the name of the victims. I eject all the sperm I have received, I turn the milk of my breasts into poison. I take back the world I gave birth to. I bury it in my womb. Down with the happiness of submission. Long live hate, rebellion, and death. Now this, of course, is not Christa Wolf's Cassandra. But the text spoken by Elektra at the conclusion of Heiner Müller's Hamlet machine, radical revolt against a male-dominated world. Cassandra Draupadi stands for the armed resistance of the tribals defending their land, the tribals who are, of course, officially denounced as terrorists. Now, of course, in all of this, one must ask what kind of spectator is required to decipher all these subtle and complex references without commentary? Maybe it requires the still rare, globally conversant spectator familiar with both the Indian and the European sources and able to unlock their present-day transformations. Clearly, Malani does not simply bank on creating experiential fascination, overwhelming the spectator with theatrical sensuous effects, although they obviously exist. Her multi-layered montage narrative, and there is indeed a narrative here, requires attentive reading, reflection, and translation. It is not easy to enter into this palimpsest of shadow figures and projections that mix European and Indian, ancient and modern, art historical, and in-your-face political motives in the aesthetic construction. The knowledge of Christa Wolf's Cassandra and Heiner Müller's Hamlet machine whose bound and bandaged Ophelia is, of course, itself referenced in Malani's bandaged head, is, of course, not enough to understand the specific Indian dimensions. But it provides an entry for the Western spectator who is challenged to develop a transcontinental hermeneutic to distill aesthetic and cognitive experience from the fascination by colorful images and shadowy palimpsests. Translation is demanded 
even if there always are moments that appear or may appear untranslatable. Malani's moving image worlds want to be read slowly in multiple viewings of this looped 11 minute long video shadow play. And ultimately, the reader may then get lost again in the aesthetic charm of circling images, but now with a deeper knowledge of an installation that in its structure of repetitive loops may point to the simultaneous, simultaneous futility and unavoidability of ongoing political memory work. And without overrating my two examples, I might suggest the following. In negotiation with and a simultaneous distancing from classical European modernism, there emerges an alternative art praxis that may strike us as avant-gardist in its self-conscious coupling of aesthetics, memory, and politics. But it is an avant-gardism quite different from that of the historical European avant-garde. Avant-gardism not as a model of progress or utopia dependent on the experience of shock or on the most advanced cutting-edge state of the artistic material, which would be digital art practice, or on the disavowal of any and all realisms. Avant-gardism rather as a challenge to think politically through spectacular sensuous installations that create effect both on the local and on the global stage. Avant-gardism not as programmatic destruction of traditional notions of autonomy and the artwork, but as insistence on the specificity of aesthetic work and with that the reinscription of a boundary between art on the one hand and all that is part of a presentist culture of quick consumption and careless forgetting on the other. In Kentridge and Malani's work, the remembrance of historical trauma and contemporary politics are aesthetically mediated in such a way that depth, stru that depth structures of domination and social conflict in our world are illuminated for the spectator. In this sense, then, their work is political through and through. Their use of traditional, even obsolete techniques of representation marks a turn against a presentist technological triumphalism that privileges only the, the digital. It is no longer, however, a philosophy of history that anchors this kind of avant-gardism, but on the contrary, a sustained doubt in merely technological progress combined with a political critique of a failing present that has not redeemed the promises of modernity. And in this way, and here comes a final twist in the argument, this avant-gardism from the periphery can itself be called quite traditional since it transforms the critique of modernity, which was always already part of European avant-gardism itself, for a post-colonial globalizing world. Thank you very much for your attention.